no, I won't go forward because I'll jump ahead too far. Uh, this location uh, gives you some, the key characteristic that, um, that embodies the value of these towers. Part of it is just the proximity to the, um, the kind of excitement, the commercial dynamism of 57th Street, the things that go on there, the boutique stores, uh, the great restaurants. But the thing that these buildings um, are uh, taking advantage of uh, in exploiting the value of the land like you saw on Wall Street uh, is not so much the land as the value of the views. Uh, in order to command this kind of panoramic view of Central Park, there is no greater trophy in New York than to have a view of Central Park. Uh, and so all of the towers that I, that I showed you before take advantage of that. Uh, this is the, uh, we got to go on a construction tour of 157, this is the penthouse of 157 last, uh, last fall, and you can see that it looks very much like the, uh, the rendering that envisioned it, and I'll show you um, some more views, but this panorama of a horizon, and we're in New York, how many places in New York can you actually see a horizon, but from this elevated view, which is about a thousand feet in the air, the top, building tops off at a thousand and three feet, um, you see a continuous horizon uh, from the, uh, well, the New York Harbor, you can see as well, but here you're looking north across Central Park um, to New Jersey and up to Westchester. Um, and it's that that commands $100 million um, in, of investment. Uh, but it's not just in a story about 57th Street and Central Park South, because this is the Herzog and de Moron series of stacked villas uh, that are part of the 56 Leonard Project, was in, in Lower Manhattan in Tribeca. And there you can see the, the design feature of these kind of these cantilevers is the um, device that makes that distinguishes the identity of this particular building, but it's the panoramic views of the rivers that are the real sail, sail um, force behind this project. Uh, at, from Central Park, the view of the towers, as they begin to uh, cluster at the southern end, you can see in this rendering that projects what they'll look like in about uh, 2019, so about three years from now, this is what the way um, Central Park will, will look looking south. Uh, and um, these, this is in the tradition of the location of the towers of the 1920s, which were the ultra-luxury hotels, the Pierre, the Sherry Netherland, uh, and uh, the Ritz that you see in the back. These were the living hotels, the residence hotels, uh, that serviced the swank and posh uh, set of, uh, of New York wealth back from the 1920s, and it was the hotels that took this setback form that was characteristic of the office buildings in New York, because in 1916, New York passed its first regulation, municipal regulation, of um, form and use, so our zoning law in 1916 shaped towers in the setback, the same kind of form as you think of the Chrysler Building or the Empire State Building, was applied to the commercial office type of hotels, uh, whereas residence, residential buildings were capped in their height, it's changed a little bit, 80 feet, 90 feet, 120 feet, but, it, but you couldn't be any taller than that. It was only hotels that were the luxury form and, and created this silhouette of the skyline of, a, of the slender uh, tower or reaching up uh, above the, the rest of the um, matting crowd. Now, it was these two projects, which are not super tall nor slender, which established the other thing that was necessary for these buildings to, um, to become a true type, and that was the platform of price of about $3,000 a square foot. And the Time Warner Center, which has one residential tower, one hotel tower, and a massive commercial um, complex at the base at Columbus Circle at the southwest corner of Central Park, um, achieved a sales price in the first round of the penthouses of about $3,000 um, a square foot. Uh, and um, beyond that, in about 2004, 2007, when they actually occupied the apartments, uh, was this uh, Robert A.M. Stern project, the 15th Central Park West, the developers Zeckendorf. Uh, and th they sold a, a penthouse for, I think, $47 million, you'll see um, in a moment. It wasn't until you, um, there was a sales price of $3,000 a square foot that the construction costs of the super slender towers um, 
could show a profit. But once uh, this corner of Central Park um, became a residential, um, um, ca a residential cachet, it always had a historical cachet, as you saw in the, the luxury towers, but people weren't living here so much, and not so on 50. 57th Street uh, wasn't, didn't have the, the kind of uh, special address that Park Avenue or Fifth Avenue had. Uh, but um, once you could, you could advance that price for new construction, that became the, the base from which all of these towers made sense on a balance sheet. And the, the, the same uh, towers that were, hope, that were hoping in their first business plans to make $4,000 a square foot are making $8,000 a square foot, six to 8000 so um, for the exhibition that we did called of Sky High and the Logic of Luxury, we did a lot, a lot of work. And we made this chart that um, looked at the site assembly for each one of the buildings, because there were only about a dozen buildings. And we went back into the 1980s and looked at condos. We looked at the sales price, and it was always easy to find in the newspaper the sales price for, um, for a, a, a penthouse. That made news, real estate news, uh, even though it was very hard to find individual statistics for per square uh, foot price. So, so we did a, a lot of work in order to get a kind of quick picture of uh, what was the, the duration of investment, of time, uh, of the kind of monopoly game of site assembly, and then how much was paid in the first sale of the apartment in the condominium project. Um, and as you can see, um, some of the ones that, um, like, the, the, there we have 15 Central Park, uh, you can't, my dot doesn't seem to be working, but then the upper range there, um, nearly $3,000, $2,700 a square foot, first uh, penthouse apartment, uh, 15 Central Park West paid $49 million in adjusted 2013 uh, uh, dollars, and then, or I think we were doing it in 2012, it resold four years later for twice the price. And this is not unusual. New York, even with the recession in 2000, um, 2008 to 2012, um, the prices, as you can see in that corner there, Manhattan condo sales from 2000 to 2012 doubled across the board. Um, that form. So the, um, the the characteristic of uh, the constraint of zoning is the other thing that really models these towers. And um, as you can see in, a, in, in our exhibition, we put together the 432 Park Avenue um, into a tower that showed you the development that was demolished on the site, um, the Drake Hotel, and then in color, the unused air rights of the low-rise buildings that hadn't been developed yet that could be piled on top of the tower instead. So they took that setback low-rise or mid-rise form um, in order to create this tower and then the, the uh, additional space piled on top. Uh, and the previous law would have allowed for this kind of setback, but the 1961 change of zoning to something called the floor area ratio, FAR, um, sets a maximum amount of floor area that you could build on your lot, that's associated with the lot, and you can build as of right within, with uh, any amount, in any shape on your lot um, with that amount of floor space, piling it up. Um, into a skinny little tower or making it a middle-sized full, uh, full uh, footprint of the tower uh, or buying the adjacent air rights and piling them up. And that's what all of these the super slender projects do. Um, but the thing that's important to remember about the constraint of the FAR uh, is that it's a cap and trade system, the FAR and, and, um, and air rights, because the spaces that are created by in these open spaces where the drake was torn down and piled on top of the tower in order to lift those eyeballs high enough in the periscope of these buildings in order to see Central Park, um, that um, keeps forever low and in sunshine these small these spaces that are full through where they're set back. So that, I'll show you a bunch of zoning diagrams, but this is the um, center of the tower, um, that, that footprint, what was previously on that entire L-shaped part of the site, is now all piled up into a tower that rises 1,300 feet. Uh, the zoning lot diagram shows you how that's accomplished. 
I know, I know I need to um, accelerate at this point. Another project that uses the air rights piled onto the site is the um, somewhat controversial Jean Nouvel MoMA Tower that was designed back in about 2007-8 and then held up by the recession. Um, you can see the difference between what was allowed on the site and then what was accrued from the air rights. And that, those two towers are simply the transfer of the adjacent air rights over a landmark property and an adjacent um, undeveloped property. Uh, this, uh, the MoMA Tower um, got a haircut of 200 feet because it was one of the few towers that had to go through the public review process. Um, and when it went before city planning, the city planning chairman didn't like it very much, thought it, was, it um, competed too much with the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building on the skyline, and said it would look better at 1,050 feet. And they just cut two, 200 feet off of it in the planning review process, which makes you understand why nobody wants to go through the planning review process. No developer wants to go through the planning review process, and they don't have to in New York because these buildings are all built as of right, uh, according to the maximum FAR you're allowed to put um, onto your site, the adjacent, the uh, air rights transfer, and then you can build whatever shape you want without any public review. There's some discussion about that now. Um, the, um, there's uh, an additional, the constraint of zoning, you can see on the 111 West 57th project as it, sh as it uh, shaves back according to the setbacks that are required by the um, angle of the sun. Um, it was also adjacent to uh, rising on a site of the, um, a landmark building, which is right down here, and it moved back to the center of the block. And um, so on a site that is 59 feet by 80 feet wide, they're putting about 90 stories. Uh, again, with two elevators, because, um, and there's the view, it's got a terracotta um, uh, cladding on the two concrete walls that are holding it up into the sky. And here you can see a typical um, unit plan of uh, one of the apartments, which is only about 2,500 square feet. Um, it's a, there's a, duplexes that are being offered in the range of probably 70 million um, for some of the upper floors and 100, probably 100 million when they get up to the top. Um, and as you can see, um, this is, that's, the, that's a typical unit plan, but that's the entire building, right? And you see the two elevators, 90-story building, two elevators. And then the logic of luxury, which pretty much can be explained um, by these two slides. The footprint, uh, the floor plan uh, of 432 Park Avenue with highlighted the um, elevator core and the service stair, the two elevators and the service stairs. Uh, and over in the section, the, uh, the switchback scissor stairs, which are, the, I think, the best um, example in order to illustrate the logic of luxury. Um, and the, the way that the, these characteristics come together. So the floor-to-floor -floor slabs on the, uh, the, this building are 15 and a half feet between slabs, so you know, five meters between slabs. Typical in New York would have been maybe 11 feet, 12 feet, and I know your 80-story tower, towers probably have 10, 10 and a half foot ceilings, something like that. These are 15 and a half foot ceilings. And the reason they are that um, is because in New York, um, you have to have a landing after every a certain amount. And the, the way that you can create the most efficient um, vertical stair uh, uh, core is through these switchback scissor stairs that where there's a shared landing. But the only way, according to code, you can share a landing in these prefabricated stairs that are going to meet each other is by keeping your slab 15 and a half feet apart. It's the only way you can do it um, according to code. But 15 and a half feet give, makes it um, a more expensive building to build. You get a lot of extra air between your slabs, but you get your eyeballs three feet higher per floor into the air. So to this tower, which was originally 1,200, um, about you know, 1,100 feet when it was designed is about 1,400 feet now, having the same FAR, right, the same floor area ratio, because that's a maximum. It's the only, that's the amount you, that the, the law will allow you to place on the building. So the logic of, of luxury says build a more luxurious building with higher ceilings, 
um, you'll be able to, well, the switchback scissor stair, I forgot to tell you, reduces by 10% the economy of the vertical staircase. So the 10% of area that you save as the developer, you can sell at 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, or $10,000 a square foot, and you walk out of the elevator directly into an apartment rather than to an corridor. So the single unit per floor, the two units per floor is the only way you can accomplish this. And that's, of course, is the, 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 the great trophy wow factor of these, these buildings is you come up through the elevator, the doors open, and you see Central Park straight out before you. That's worth $100 million to people. This is Raphael Vignoli explaining that. Um, there it is, the switchback scissor stair and the values that, um, just to look at quickly what these buildings look like in the landscape and renderings. They look, uh, didn't take a, I have uh, only gray day pictures in order to show you, but it looks just like that. These are the um, extraordinary um, proportions and elegance of this building, which is predicated on the square grid and a 10 foot square, uh, exactly 10 and a half foot square window. Uh, and um, design matters in a lot of variations, but the Herzog and Demoran project, which um, this is the view from the construction elevator looking south to uh, one um, World Trade Center and the um, Silverstein and Robert A.M. Stir project under construction there, another super slender which is called 30 Park Place and combines a, a Four Seasons Hotel in the base and uh, apartments above. There are some mixed use among these, but, but they're all, but the residential is the high end um, in every aspect of the projects. Um, and that's what it looked like in the rendering. Uh, another Stern project uh, just off Park Avenue on one of the cross streets. Uh, and this one has, as you'll see in a, a later um, graph, uh, just 183,000 square feet uh, of, uh, of floor area within them. Just to show you some others, another Ramsa project. This is the one that's right smack up against the, um, the tallest tower, which is uh, uh, all glazed, and another developer, but um, they don't like to show their competitors in any of their um, idealized uh, hero uh, shots. Uh, interior views, projections of what those apartments would look like. Um, this is the one on 22nd Street, which has one Madison right next to it, where Rupert Murdoch had bought the top three floors uh, of uh, the glass tower. And this one is about a little bit taller and looks at the um, great historic skyscrapers like um, um, the Metropolitan Life Tower and uh, Empire State Building. Uh, and that's what it looks like in day and night in the KPF drawings. Uh, and here's the Norman Foster, very slender building, which is now all condominiums. Started out as a Shangri-La hotel, but it will be um, uh, the mostly, I mean mostly 90% condominiums uh, right behind the Seagram building and a slenderness that allows that building to pull away and separate itself in space and also rise up and peak above the surrounding office buildings on Lexington Avenue, which you'd think is a very unusual place um, to have a project like this. And there are some drawings um, that we developed at the Skyscraper Museum in order to show you the profiles of these buildings. And you can see very clearly the two that don't belong um, in this uh, lineup. Uh, they're the ones here. This is uh, in Hudson Yards, the Diller Scafidio project. It's too fat and it's residential down below. Uh, I mean, it's a uh, rental below and condos above, and this is another one that is a mixed-use uh, tower with just residential at the top, including some office at the base. Uh, and um, this one, the, the tallest one, the one, one Central Park, has uh, retail down here, a hotel in this section, and then the tall tower that rises above. So these are the slender um, strategy buildings. Um, you see some additional ones in here that I won't name. Uh, and these are the square foot areas that of those same towers, which you can see range from um, over a million square feet to 178,000 square feet. So they pack all of that um, space into similar types of forms, but shorter, but always the same strategy of using that floor area in order to accomplish um, this kind of bean pole, beer beanstalk uh, kind of form, but the I think the most accurate um, metaphor or trope for these buildings is periscopes. They're just slender, um, slender shafts that rise up in order to place um, an eye looking out at the city, looking around. 
Um, and I know, I think I've gone over my time, and so I won't, won't um, talk too much, or you can question me, about uh, the, the critiques of these towers, which have been um, manifold in New York, especially in the New York Times, uh, in a series, uh, a five-part series that talked about the towers of uh, um, the Time Warner Center and the nefarious people who um, were um, protecting themselves under limited liability corporations in order to buy those properties and protect their identities. Uh, but in fact, um, if you look at, and you saw that one before, the sales, it's not just in the super slender towers or the glass, uh, the towers of secrecy, so-called by the New York Times. Um, the appreciation of apartments uh, in New York is across the boards in pretty much equal measure. And these are towers which are not super slender but have, appre have similarly appreciated. So I think um, that it's a specious argument that has been um, uh, 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 leveled against the particular towers. But this is the, the important argument, the one about the public space and the way that uh, the towers cast shadows onto the shared amenities of public space, taking their the private um, privilege and, uh, and Im impinging on our, our public space. And that is something which is much discussed in New York. Uh, but I think not discussed um, with an, a nearly enough nuance, because the shadows are certainly there. This is one from 157. Um, but I think we have to talk qualitatively uh, about shadows, because the slender shadow of uh, one Madison that you see here, this is from my apartment looking down on, uh, on Madison Square Park uh, on a winter's day like, like January 2nd. And the slender tower you can see acts as a kind of sundial. This is the historic tower of Metropolitan Life uh, um, world's tallest building in 1909. Um, and here's, uh, this is my building casting a, a major shadow. It's only 31 stories tall. And it, it would, in the, next, in the next hour, it would cover the entire of, um, Central Park in, in, not, I mean, Madison Square Park in shadow. But you can see the slender tower is already passed by. So there's, uh, I appreciated this morning the shadow projections that, that Chris showed us. And that we need to do much more study, heliostats and all, all sorts of things, ref reflected light. But the question about how we, sh how we might shade um, our public spaces um, certainly needs to be raised, but I think I would argue um, in the end that the idea that the rules of, of the game of monopoly in, in uh, Manhattan real estate have been set uh, by, the, by the zoning law 50 years ago and as of right has created, as you saw in that imagined um, cityscape of, the, of uh, New York in about five years hence, uh, an extraordinary 21st century identity of the city, which is, uh, is absolutely characteristic with its history, with its um, a, a city of towers identity, with the this, with this slenderness as an exploitation and a reaction um, to the great value um, of land, and which is um, in its uh, essence the, the, um, the very identity of New York. Thank you.